It said that John Whitfield scarcely ever preached without weeping. By the way, he died of an asthmatic attack in his early 50s, John Whitfield. He was one of the later reformers. But in his short life, he helped pave the way for great Reformation revivals of the 18th century, 1700s, by the way, and ultimately the rise of the Advent movement, John Whitfield. Just so heavily did souls weigh on his heart, his heart went out to people, to, for the people who filled his meeting halls with, with their presence, to hear the broad bread of life, to hear the purest gospel preached since the days of Martin Luther. John Whitfield. That consuming zeal also burned in the bosom of John Knox. Late one night, John Knox left the, left the back door of his study to pass out from his house down into a dark enclosure in the back of his house. He was followed unknown by him by one of his friends who was staying with him for a while. And when after a few moments of silence, John Knox's unintelligible voice could be heard as if in prayer. In another moment, the sounds deepened into recognizable words, and an earnest petition to God went out from his struggling soul. O oh Lord, he prayed, give me Scotland or I die. Then a pause and a hushed stillness as if waiting for an answer. When again the petition broke, O oh Lord, Give me Scotland or I die. And once more silence. When once again, with deeper, more intense pathos, the three times repeated intercession struggled forth. Oh Lord, give me Scotland or I die. He was all consumed with a love for the lost. And God answered that prayer. To us also, the wonderful promise is found in Psalms 2, verse 8. Let's take a look at that. Psalms is an easy book to find. Psalms chapter 2, verse 8. Say amen when you found it. Psalm 2, verse 8. Here's what it says. Ask of me, and I will give you the heathen for your inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for your possession. What does that mean? Well, that's an extension of the Gospel Commission, isn't it? The gospel goes to all the world, and obviously, if we have the Gospel to share, He wants us to have a love for the souls that are lost. The Lord wants to give us Sierra Vista for an inheritance, but it has to be a heartfelt conviction and a love for the people that are in this village, in this valley. We're talking about Jesus here. He'd answer a prayer like that, don't you think so? When he sees his people rise to the challenge in true-hearted love for people, he'll answer that prayer. This isn't a natural response, but God wants, us to, wants to give us a supernatural miracle response. You know, there are wonderful promises to those who give themselves to this work. Here are two of them. They're in the book of Daniel. Uh, Daniel, chapter 12. Oh, well, the first one is in chapter 11. Daniel, chapter 11. Right after Ezekiel. I'd like to have us see this in your Bible. Genesis, chapter 11, verse 32. Daniel, did I what I say? Daniel chapter 11, verse 2. 32, I'm sorry. <laughs> Daniel 11, verse 32. Here's what it says. I'm just going to read the last part of that verse. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Wow. And then verse 33, the first part. And they that understand among the people shall instruct many. They that understand. We think we have a little understanding, don't we? A little bit of understanding. It's growing day by day as we study the word. And our love for people will grow as our faith grows. And uh, 
we might look at another one, Daniel chapter 12 and verse 3. And the context here is the end time. After Michael stands up, it's the time of the great time of trouble. And verse 3 says, And they, they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. What wonderful promises. The context here is the time of the end. Adventists in the last remnant of time have been given a most precious message. And I'll have to tell you, we have some of the most beautiful literature in the world, right? Feast your eyes on some of those, liter those pieces of literature out there that you could be proud to give to somebody else. Especially designed for the final generation of earth people just before Jesus comes. And we have a message for the, for the world. Let's look at it. Let's just review it again and take all the comfort we can out of it. Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 and 7. I never tire of reading this passage. And uh, it's our commission, is the commission of the final people living in the final generation to the world. Angel here means messenger. And these angels are messengers. And who are these messengers? They're people, right? These messengers are people. Revelation 14, verse 6 and 7. It says, and I saw another angel. Margin of my Bible says messenger. Fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice. What kind of a voice? Loud. A loud voice. Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. And worship him that made heaven and earth and sea and the fountains of waters. That's our message. That's our commission. God has given us a commission just like the disciples of old in the first century. Never before in the history of the world has it been more important than the day in which we are, are privileged to live and love and work for God. Never in the history of the world more important. They're out there. They're out there waiting to hear. Souls are wistfully looking to heaven for light. And we find them every once in a while, don't we? Acts of the Apostles 109. Many are on the verge of the kingdom, waiting only to be gathered in. And many will accept the heaven-born message. Again, Acts of the Apostles, page 4. Besides still waters, in every town and village, there are persons who would embrace truth if it were brought before them. There are people like that. And uh, Jim and I, we have a privilege of finding some of those people. And Craig and others here who are looked and... Um, who are looking for them. Some of you may have heard me tell this story before, but it's a beautiful story. In California, a woman was searching for truth, and a local church member gave her a gift Bible and, a, and, and some lessons. And this lady must have told a dear friend in Chicago. Now, she's living in L.A. She must have told a dear friend in Chicago, who immediately flew from Chicago down to California to save her friend from what she thought were the Adventist errors. Two weeks later, she went home to Chicago with a gift Bible in her hands and some lessons in her suitcase, and a new hope was found in her heart, and today they're both baptized into Christ's body. We must so good seed beside all waters, that they will come when they will come to us. But in the meantime, you know, the day is coming, I believe, when the doors of this church will, they'll almost want to break it down to get in here into this building, that that day is coming. When the gospel was first preached after many years of communism in Russia, they were, they were, they were stacked up down the street and the sidewalks trying to get in, and the place was full, was full. First time they'd heard about Jesus, some of them. And uh, so in the meantime, and in the now, we must put our feet in the water in faith, and God will give us a harvest when he comes. Revelation 14, 14, and 15. Now, we read Revelation 14, 6 and 7. That's the message. But when we get down to 14 and 15, notice what it says. Just a few verses down, verse 14. And I looked, and behold, a white throne. 
a white cloud, I'm sorry, and, and upon the cloud one sat like the Son of Man, having on his head a, a golden crown and in his hand a sharp sickle. What do you use a sickle for? Yeah, we don't know much about that anymore, do, do we? We have swathers now. You cut hay real quick. <clears throat> and another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of earth is ripe. Wow. It's, it's seed sowing time, my friends. We have beautiful literature to share. How will the work be finished? I've been on a street corner in a big city looking at the people. They weren't smiling like you guys are. They have somber looks on their faces. They have troubles. They came to Las Vegas so that they, they could have some fun. Because life's getting pretty dreary. How will the book be finished? Thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of people. The book of Acts records how it happened in the first century. The book of Acts is a revelation of how the Holy Spirit consumed the hearts of people in the first century. The book of Acts is an unfinished book. If you read through the book of Acts and read the last verses in the book of Acts, guess what? It just leaves you hanging. It's an unfinished story. The last verses just leave you hanging, and that revelation in the book of Acts will find its, its completion in the final generation just before Jesus comes. Spirit-filled people will be going from house to house, proclaiming the Sabbath more fully. Jesus is coming. Let's review a couple of texts. We sang a beautiful song a while ago. Lift up the trumpet, loud let it ring. I'd like to have you turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. Many of you can quote this by heart. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. I still hear pages. Say amen if you found it. 16 and 17. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 16 and 17. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven. Who? The Lord. the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. We've referred to that as the first resurrection, right? And then verse 17, and then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. What a wonderful day that will be. And then uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Some of you can quote this one too. Let's just feast our eyes on this. This is all we have, you know. 1 Corinthians 15, 51. It won't always be this way. One of these days, Jesus is coming. And notice what happens then. Verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this incorruptible, this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, grave, where is your victory? You know, we're in the miserable business right now of burying one another, aren't we? But when Jesus comes, everything changes. Wow. The message of Christ's return will consume the last generation believer, of believers with a love for others. Thousands will be baptized in one day, and around the planet, that's already happening. What will they teach? It will be the biblical message that was taught in the first century. 
in the first century. I think you could go to the first century church in the book of Acts and the, and the letters of Paul, and you can find at least 28 fundamentals in the first century. 28 Bible teachings. They're all through the, all through the New Testament. Let's look at some of them. Righteousness by faith. The resurrection, the triune God. The eternal divinity of Christ. The personhood of the Holy Spirit. The judgment. The state of the dead. The spirit of prophecy. All of these things were taught in the first century. The judgment. The reliability and inspiration of the scriptures. They talked about that. The Sabbath, the great controversy, the everlasting gospel. I think we find at least 28 fundamentals in the first century. What do you think the final generation church is going to teach? If they're a remnant, we think of a bowl of cloth, right? What is the remnant? It's what's left at the very end. It'll look just like the first century church. It'll have the same zeal for souls. It'll have the same love for Jesus. God's last remnant will be fortified in believing and teaching all these same things. Jesus had just returned to heaven at his ascension. And in his followers was such a love for the truth that they were moved to witness. Um, and you know, it wasn't by addition. It was by multiplication. Let's read it. Acts chapter 2, verses 14, uh, 46 and 47, Acts chapter 2, book of Acts, wow. Have you read the book of Acts lately? Book of Acts is our book. Acts chapter 2, 46 and 47. Here's what it says. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day they were added to them about 3,000 souls. And verse 42, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. I've heard, heard, heard somebody say, I don't want to hear the doctrines. I just want to know about Jesus, right? <laughs> you know, every true doctor, doctrine, every true doctrine is a little window through which you can see Jesus more clearly. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking bread and in prayers. Chapter 5, verse 42. Acts chapter 5, verse 42. And daily in the temple and in every house they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. What was the object of their message? Jesus Christ, right? And salvation. In the temple and in every house, here was a union of personal and public evangelism. They ceased not until they were literally driven out of Jerusalem. By persecution, they fled, and they took the gospel to the world with such power that Paul could say by the year A.D. 62 that the gospel has been preached to every creature under heaven. Just a few short years, 30 years after Jesus went back. It was not by habit that they did this, but by the, their connection that they had with God through the Holy Spirit. They were driven. We should continue to lay plans for lay evangelism. I'd like to spend time with anyone who's interested about how to give Bible studies and witness to neighbors and relatives and friends. And um, there are a number of people in this church already doing that. It's just wonderful. I've never been in a church like this before. Over 99% of our people are lay people. <clears throat> we are a lay-driven church. We're called to be disciples and to make disciples of all people. That's why we exist. There's no reason for this church to exist except for that. And in the process, we'll have great fellowship, right? And we'll be a support to one another. What is a disciple? Jesus said, follow me and I will make you what? Fishers of men. A disciple is one who follows Jesus in cooperation with him for the salvation of others. That's what a disciple is. 
How do you like to have Jesus for a partner? <laughs> oh, my. He said, I'd like to yoke up with you. And I'm going to give you power from on high to, take, to follow this through. If the church will arise to the challenge of inviting the Holy Spirit to fill us with love for people of every nation, tribe, and people, if we covenant with each other, there will be fire in the church. And under the conditions of the work of evangelism, it will be effective by the process of addition. A while ago I said addition. It's not by addition. The Bible says by multiplication. Let's read a couple of texts about multiplication. Acts chapter 9, verse 31. Acts 9, verse 31. This is how it was in the first century. Acts 9, verse 31. Acts 9, verse 31. Then had the churches rest throughout Judea and Galilee and Samaria, and were edified, and walking in the fear of the Lord, and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost, were, what does it say? Multiplied. Not by the process of addition, but they're multiplied. Let's look at another one. It's uh, Acts 12, verse 24. Acts 12, verse 24. <clears throat> Acts 12, verse 24. We're over just a few pages to the right. By the word, but the word of God grew and multiplied. That's a promise. That's a promise to the final generation of people who are living on the earth who are giving the gospel. Adlai Esteb. I told this story before, and some of you have heard it, some of you haven't. Adlai Esteb. He was the Adventist poet. How many of you remember that name? Adlai Esteb. Okay. All right. He wrote a poem about two Canadian geese standing in a field. Looking up, they were admiring a high-flying jet with a tail behind it. And admiring the high-flying passenger plane above them, one of them said to the other one, my, I wish I could fly like that. And the other one said, you could if your tail was on fire. <laughs> and perhaps we need to have a high horizons and dreams about what the Lord could do in our church if we will just allow him to do it. Amen. There will yet be a great religious revival. The greatest revival in the history of the world is still ahead of us. And I have to tell you, I believe the greatest days for the church are still ahead of us. Amen. Like the days of Martin Luther and Knox and Whitfield and William Miller, only this time under latter rain power. The Lord is going to pour out his spirit in great abundance. It's for that day that we should now be preparing. He wants to put love in our hearts. Love for the lost. Pray for the Holy Spirit every day. We are possessors of God's last message of love to the world. I believe that. That's why I'm standing in this pulpit. That's a great advantage and responsibility to be in possession of the oracles of God, which are his words. We are possessors, but we also must be professors, ambassadors for God in the home, in the school, in the church, in the workplace, and out there in the larger world around us. Telling and doing. We will never do the unfinished work unless we invite the Holy Spirit into our minds and our hearts and ask him that the love of God may come and consume us. Once Jesus said, you don't have because you don't what? You don't ask. So what should, I be, what should we be praying for? <laughs> we should be praying for the Holy Spirit. I'd like to have you look at a text with me. We had this in prayer meeting the other night. By the way, I'd like to invite you to prayer meeting. We had a big prayer meeting this last week. Wayne, right? <clears throat> Zechariah, chapter 10. Right near the end of the Old Testament. Zechariah, chapter 10. And verse 1. Let's all look at this together. Zechariah 10, verse 1.
It says, ask you of the Lord rain in the time of the latter rain. So the Lord shall make bright clouds and give them showers of rain to every one grass in the field. Beautiful text, isn't it? Ask ye of the Lord rain in the time of the latter rain. Love for souls will be the result. The Holy Spirit is the source of love. The Bible says in Romans 5, 5, that the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost who is given to us. Where do we get the love from? We can't just say, well, I'm going to go out and love people today, right? I'm going to go out there and I'm going to tell them the best. You know, it doesn't work that way. We need to spend time in prayer and in Bible study. In what? Prayer and Bible study, okay? And ask the Holy Spirit to come into our lives, into our hearts, so that we have love for people. Old evil habits of life will be dispelled. Anybody ever have old habits that need to be dispelled? As our sights now are on others. When we become other-minded, why our own problems disappear. Others, yes, others, this let my motto be. Others, yes, others, so that I can live like thee. Words of the poet, song, songwriter. Perhaps that can be illustrated by an old story that George Vanderman used to tell. I told this in Danielle and, and Theo's house one time, the story about Brother William. I just love the story. Some of you have heard it, some of you haven't. But a sailing ship was driven by hurricane force winds into the rocky coast of Scotland. Wind and waves and rocks were fast beating the vessel to pieces. A life-saving crew on the shore saw the vessel's plight and went to the rescue in a small lifeboat. The storm shrieked like a band of demons, but the heroic efforts of those lifesavers succeeded in, re in recovering the, in rescuing the crew. And as they drew away from the, from the vessel that was sinking, they saw one poor fellow who had, been, who had still been, who had been overlooked and still clinging to the rigging, rigging of that, of that uh, fast broken up ship. Despair was written on his face, but the rescuers reasoned that they could not go back. They'd all be lost. Too dangerous was the storm and it was picking up, picking up power. If we make an attempt, we will all be beat to pieces with the rocks and the pieces of ship that were floating around in the water. So they left the man clinging hopelessly to a piece of the ship, which was breaking up on the rocks. Back on the beach, a strong young man saw the goings on. He purposed to go. He cried, if another will go with me, we will go and get that man on the wrecked ship. His mother, who was standing by his side, put her arms around him. My boy, you must not go. Remember, your father was a sailor, and he was lost at sea in a storm like this. And eight years ago, your brother William went to sea, and we have not seen him since. No doubt he too has found a watery grave. Now, if you go and are drowned, what will I do? I am poor and old. You're my only support. You must not go. But gently removing his arms from around his mother's neck, he said, Mother, out there is a man in peril. I believe it is my duty to rescue him. And if I'm lost in duty, God will take care of you. Then kissing her sweet, wrinkled face, he and his companion stepped into a little rowboat and rowed out through the storm. Those on the shore waited long and anxiously, straining their eyes on the fast, destructing ship, hoping to see a precious little boat return with three people in it. By and by, they saw it in the distance, striving to make it ashore through the mist and the gathering darkness and the wind and the waves. Weary and worn, they were coming. The two brave men struggled against the odds with all their heart, all their, their strength remaining to reach land. 
And when they were close enough to land to be heard, those on the shore shouted, have you got the other man? Lifting up his hands to his mouth with trumpet words to trumpet his words so that they could better hear, he said, yes, tell mother, it's brother William. It was only one individual he rescued that day, but the one lifted from the perishing rigging was his own lost brother, whom they hadn't seen for eight years. So it is with us, about us, everywhere, our souls perishing and clinging to some earthly thing, and soon to be swept away by the coming storm. They are our brothers and sisters out there. And Jesus is coming soon. Will you join me this morning in saying, yes, Lord, I want to join in earnest prayer for an unselfish love for people. That's why we're here. Oh, how the angels are enthralled and astonished at this prospect. These are things that they desire to see and look into, the angels. And I believe they pray for us. How many of you think the angels pray for us? Jesus prayed for us, right, in John 17. What a prayer. I would suggest that as an afternoon read, John chapter 17, Jesus praying for us. Do you like it when somebody prays for you? Yeah. The Bible says there's joy in heaven over one sinner that repents. I want to summarize and draw all this together. Three points. Number one, that all heaven is astir. Do you believe that? Yes. Yeah, all heaven is astir. These final days and moments of earth's history. Number two, I also believe that this planet, with its precious cargo of people, are in great agitation and fear. You can see it on the news, you can see it everywhere you look. Not knowing what to do next as they watch from the shore, like sheep without a shepherd. And as the storm that Jesus prophesied in Matthew 24 picks up steam, there will be an increased interest in spiritual things among earth people, an increased interest. I think I begin to see that a little bit. It is a little easier than it used to be 10 years ago even. And number three, we who know the outcome, as described in Daniel and Revelation, we who know that outcome, we must not be lulled to sleep. By helping others, we too will be rescued from the sinking ship. You know, very soon we're going to have, and I think uh, Jim talked about this in his opening remarks today, in a few days, there will be evangelism in Sierra Vista. What is evangelism? <laughs> we don't have enough of it, do we? I'll have to tell you that evangelism in the church is good, is good for the church as it is for anybody else that comes. It's revival time in the church. And so it will be our privilege to bring others with us. What a way to start the new year. I want to appeal to you to mark your calendars. I pray that everyone that's here this morning will be here on January the 6th, that's Friday evening, at 7 o'clock. Everyone that's here. You know, <clears throat> I'm going to unload on you a little bit. It's awful easy for us. We're hardworking people, right? And when we come to Friday, we're all tired out. Maybe during the next couple of weeks, we could purpose in our minds to kind of quit around noon on Friday. Start preparing for next Sabbath tonight and tomorrow morning and Monday morning and Tuesday morning and Wednesday morning and Friday noon, take a rest. Friday is the what day? Preparation. Preparation day. And our meetings will start 
on Friday evening at 7 o'clock in this room. Please, all of you, come. Bring somebody with you. There are lots of invitations. Do you know that 25,000 invitations went out to four zip codes? I think most of you received one in the mail. And uh, I have to tell you that uh, somebody told me that statistically, one out of every thousand will come to the meeting. That'd be 25 people, right? And sometimes more, but that's statistically an average. Pray for two, okay? And bring somebody with you, somebody, that, give them an invitation. Uh, we all have friends, we have relatives, we have people that we do business with. Uh, take a little bit of time. Pray that the Lord of Harvest will bless and prosper our human efforts to honor God in this way. Plan to attend. It will be a tremendous blessing for each of you. Happy New Year to everybody. May God bless each one with sustenance and health as we move forward together. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the wonderful opportunity that we have, Lord, to help people. It makes us more and more like you, Lord. The more we help, the more we look like you. Lord, we want to be more and more like Jesus every day. Fill your love into our hearts, Lord. Please send the Holy Spirit. Encircle us, Lord, with a, with a great cloud of your love. I pray that you'll be with each one here today according to our several needs. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.